thank you for the opportunity to come and talk today. Um, this is my first time to patient conference, um, and I feel like I've been missing out, because it's been fabulous. I nearly forgot that I was talking this afternoon. I was enjoying the morning. <laughs> so, right, um, I've got a lot to get through, so I'll get on. So that's me. So why are the long-term effects of cancer treatments important? Any cancer treatment. Because more people are being diagnosed with cancer, more people are surviving. Um, that tiny little graph in the bottom left corner there, um, that's the most up to date we've got. It actually ends at about 2011, so before we've got immunotherapies. Um, but it shows a 30 year increasing trend in survival from cancer. And looking at the newer data, one in two people by the year 2030 is going to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. So it matters to all of us. But looking at longer term effects of cancer treatments, um, again, so my, my first job when I started in cancer was looking at late effects of chemotherapies. So this is why I ended up mixing my two favorite things, melanoma and late effects. Um, but presentation can be vague. Things like fatigue, you know, how do we manage that? What, what happens? What are the underlying causes? Um, so it's not always easy to pinpoint what's going on. Um, and after cancer treatment, sometimes there's an attitude that, well, you, sh you should be fine now. You've had your treatment. You should be getting on with things. But it's not as simple as that. Um, and sometimes where people do have ongoing subtle problems, it can secretly consume healthcare resources. There's an, an issue of quality of life for, for patients and, and carers and their families. So it does matter. Um, there's a human cost. There's, there's a healthcare cost. Um, and also, we don't have standard pathways and services. So late effect services will depend upon where you're based in the country, um, your locality, what services there are. And there are actually lots of services that uh, will address long-term effects of treatments that aren't actually labeled as such. So it, it does vary quite a lot. So what are late effects? I'm going to interchangeably use the terms long-term effects and late effects because there is some confusion over terms and I'll come into that a little bit more later on. So late effects, um, according to Macmillan, side effects that don't go away after cancer treatment. They can also be side effects that don't happen until months or years afterwards. Um, so, and some of that can be, if you look in literature, can be termed chronic, late, delayed, lots of different terms. Um, the National Cancer Institute in America um, that goes as far as to say that it can include physical, mental, and social problems as well. Uh, and it's important to recognize that. So immunotherapy. We've led the way in melanoma. Quite a sea change from when I started out um, in 2006. Um, and it's been great to see all of, all of these drugs come through. The ones highlighted in yellow are the ones for melanoma. I have digressed a little bit because in immunotherapy, I do look at all tumours, uh, not just melanoma. So, but this is a huge amount that's going on. Um, there's more drugs in development, ones that I cannot pronounce, and I'm not going to try to. Um, there's more indications, so more cancer types, more um, sort of like metastatic, prior to surgery, after surgery, lots going on, combinations with other immunotherapies, as we know in melanoma, but also combinations with targeted therapies, with vaccines, with traditional chemotherapy, with stem cell transplants in the hematology setting. There's an awful lot going on. And the possible side effects, another plug for the melanoma focus website here. This is some great information. I know this is, can be quite a scary slide looking at all the possible side effects. Not everyone gets all of them, fortunately. Um, but it can affect any part of the body. So it can be quite difficult to wonder, is this treatment? Is this not? Is it something else? To try and differentiate. So it's not straightforward, especially after treatment when, you know, a lot of people around us that don't necessarily know a lot about melanoma and immunotherapy may think, you know, surely you've, you're finished now and that's it. So looking at the literature, um, it varies a lot. There's not a lot out there. Again, melanoma, we have the, ma the majority of the experience in late effects, the long-term effects of treatment. And again, um, it, it can be termed differently. So 15 to 43% of patients can have side effects that persist or are delayed, um, as in occurring after treatment's been completed. So um, and this sort of affecting hormones, thinning of the hair, so things like hypophysitis, diabetes, 
um, skin reactions, the nervous system eyes. Again, lots of things that have been known to have happened after treatment's completed. Um, but very small numbers. Quite often, these are actually written up as case studies. We don't really know the real risks and how many people are going to get these things. So um, the strap line of this at the end, um, if anyone's a sci-fi fan like me and likes Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. I don't mean to scare you with this. It gets better as we go along. So the clinical problem, I'm a nurse. Um, I work in the clinics in the late effects and in the melanoma setting. But when we're looking at melanoma follow-up appointments, generally you've got about 10 minutes with your clinician. What are your scans like? And, and everyone's worrying about this, that scan anxiety. Um, doing a full skin check, you know, stripping down. And you've got to get undressed. You've got to get dressed. You've got to talk about your scans in about 10 minutes. It's not very realistic. There's no time to then talk about side effects from treatment as well, as it's really hard for both the clinician and patients. Um, and this quotes from one of my patients when I started engaging people, saying, would you be interested in this service, um, who, who did have some issues at the start. Um, so we decided to develop a nurse-led immunotherapy screening service. And to do this, I started asking for opinions. Is it something that people wanted? Were they interested in it? So I started by asking um, clinicians. Now, I started doing this about three years ago during the second wave of COVID. Not the best time to be starting up a new service that wasn't to do with COVID. Um, so the first thing I asked was, what do you think is a late effect or a chronic effect or an acute effect? And I gave people examples of, you know, is an acute effect something that happens on treatment but then persists? Or is a chronic effect something that happens on treatment and then persists? Is a late effect something that happens as soon as treatment's finished? Is it six months after treatment's finished? Is it two years? Is it five years? And people were quite confused. No one really knows. There's no definite definition. So I include all of that pretty much when I'm talking about it. Um, there was a question as to whether late effects were only for survivors whatever that means. Talking to my colleagues in the lung team, their patients don't do quite as well on immunotherapy, so they didn't see that it was a service for their patients because they don't see their patients as survivors quite often. That's not always the case. I do have some lung patients in my service, but again, it's those perceptions and trying to break down those sort of perceptions, and it's all quite a grey area. This is very new for everybody. Um, but there was definitely an educational need. People didn't know enough about the potential long-term effects of immunotherapies and were wanting to know more um, and felt that there should be some sort of monitoring for patients just to see what was going to happen again because things are relatively new from, from a drug point of view. And then I asked patients as well. I've got a great group of patients in Sheffield that are more than happy to give me their opinions. <laughs> um, so... Um, I did a survey of everyone who'd completed immunotherapy at that point in time. Again, I'm, I'm asking people during the second wave of COVID. Um, so I was so impressed that that many people replied. Um, so 57 of them listed some ongoing problems. Uh, people had completed treatment usually over a year ago. And part of that was because of the pause in treatments down to the, the COVID pandemic. Um, they listed psychological problems or worry about recurrence as, as some of the main concerns that they had. Um, and whilst most of the people would be interested in some sort of late effects service in a review um, that we were proposing, many of them were happy with the, the service that they'd got because they really trusted the teams that they'd got, which is absolutely right. Um, but the really important point was the timing. Again, we asked about, if we had this service, when would you want it? Um, would you want it? straight after treatment, six months, a year, you know, when you've been discharged from your oncology team, if that's the case. Um, and they said, no, at, right at the end of treatment, we want it soon. There's, there was that sort of feeling of, because you get a lot of appointments during treatment, there's a lot going on, it's really busy, but there can be that sense of abandonment at the end of all that, and what next? And, and actually, so we, we listen to patients, and we see p people now as soon as possible after that. Now, that does actually get a little bit messy when you've got steroid tapering involved and trying to get people off steroids, because I try not to interfere with that. We, we've got a separate steroid tapering service in Sheffield, but we all work together. So, the immunotherapy late effects service, um, it was set up with the aim to detect complications earlier to optimise quality of life, see if we can improve things. Designed to mirror the existing service, 
um, for standard chemotherapy. So um, we have a service for childhood cancer survivors who transition into adult services. We've got a service for stem cell transplant patients in hematology. We've got a specific pathway for teratoma patients. And then solid tumor patients are generally seen on um, a basis of as needed. Um, so rather than everybody automatically being referred into the service, because it is quite a small service, and you know, we do have resource limitations in the NHS, it's if the patient or the clinician or the GP think that there's a, a need to be seen by the late effect service. That's something we're working on to see if we can look at better models of care to improve that. Um, and we're supported by the late effect MDT. So because we already had that structure, uh, we've got really good support from endocrinology, uh, which we've heard about the importance of earlier. Um, but we've also got links to all specialities be because of uh, being embedded in that service. So if you came to, one, to a new patient screening appointment, what would you get? Um, for a start, you'd get to talk to me for longer than you probably want to. Um, you'd get to complete a questionnaire. So we use the SPARC questionnaire. It's the Sheffield Profile for Assessment and Referral to Care. Um, this is an example of it on the screen here. And when people bring this in, it's the first thing I look at. I'm usually quite happy if they've ringed zeros and ones. That's, that's fine, generally. It, it usually means that it's someone that just needs some monitoring, maybe a bit of support, and, and there aren't too many issues. But occasionally, things, there's other things when you actually get talking. When people come in ringing threes and quite a few twos, then I know that we actually need to do a bit more. We need, we need to do more work. And this questionnaire includes physical, psychological, social, spiritual domains as well. So it's a two-page thing. I could only put a snapshot in there. So we look at that, and then I do a full medical history, looking at cancer, uh, all cancer history. For some people, melanoma is actually their second or third cancer, so there's a lot more going on. They may have had other radiotherapy or other treatments. Um, we do a top-to-toe review, so, um, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, clinic examination where appropriate, couldn't do that at the start. So there are a lot of people who didn't actually meet me for the first 18 months of being part of the service because it was all done via telephone because that was the only way we could do it during COVID. We have now added in the physical appointments, which is great. Um, blood tests, um, we do pretty much a, a screen for fatigue because that's one of the biggest things that affects people. Um, standard blood tests that you'd have during your immunotherapy treatment, we look at hormones as well. Um, and we also add on other, or see what's been done by GPs already, and we'll probably add in things like cholesterol levels, so it, it can match in with um, the regular GP health checks. Uh, information support and lifestyle advice tailored to needs, so that's a very individual conversation that we have, and whether there's anything else that could be done. Um, and it's just a chance to, to st take stock and look at what's going on there. Um, and then where needed re rehabilitation referrals, um, referral to the GP, say if someone's pre-diabetic, if we've picked that up at some point, we can do that. Or specialist services where required if we need to refer to, say, rheumatology or gastroenterology or anything like that, if, if there's something that we've picked up that's not been addressed. So the top-to-toe review, because we know that Immunotherapy in the acute setting during treatment can affect pretty much every organ of the body. So we just do a top-to-toe questionnaire, go through everything to make sure that we have addressed everything, we've not missed anything out. So we start with, you know, eyes, have you been to the optician, have you been to the dentist? Are you taking part in other cancer screening as well, you know, as relevant to the person depending on their age and their gender? Um, any problems with lymphedema? Have they been addressed? Have all the right referrals been done? Just making sure that nothing's been missed. Um, looking at any pain that anyone's got and then looking at mental health as well and things like that. So as well as all sort of, we, we do every organ, we do mental health um, and any other social issues as well. So the service so far, it's nearly three years old. This is the two and a half year data. 106 patients, it is limited because it is just uh, one clinic a week at the moment. because I've, We were trying to expand it, but I did get pulled back into the melanoma service a bit more. Majority of patients are melanoma patients, uh, more men than women. Um, and then we've got the usual melanoma treatments, but also we have got a few others, um, depending on the, the other patients that have been referred into the service. Uh, we had an even split between patients who were having it for advanced disease and those that were having it after surgery in the adjuvant setting. And the average length, length of treatment was 12 months. So the range was 1 to 39. Um, one, people who had a reaction 
um, and, and stopped treatment at that point or had severe side effects straight away. Um, but other people who just kept going, uh, which was amazing. And, and actually, it, we sort of had the cutoff at 39 months because some treatments were, were stopped and paused during COVID. That's probably the, the reason why some people actually stopped. So the results of the holistic needs assessment. Um, most of the, sim the, the issues that were raised um, were physical symptoms, as you'd expect. But there's also the psychological issues, um, issues around independence and activity, family and social issues, and, and worry about treatment and treatment effects. So whilst we, we're interested in sort of like the long-term physical effects of these treatments, we can't take it apart from all of those other things. This is a holistic assessment because they do interact. It does make a difference. And the top 10 patient concerns. So a lot of the physical symptoms do mirror the expected side effects of immunotherapy treatments. But again, anxiety, issues with sexual function, low mood, pain, issues around body image. They're things that anyone who's had a cancer diagnosis may have issues with. So again, we, we can't unpack this all at once. And, I, and there, there are also the issues that, pe that are related to other treatments. So people who've had radiotherapy, people who've also had surgery and they've got longer term effects from their surgery. We can't, it's not easy to just pull um, immunotherapy out of that. We do include everything that's happened to a person because we try and individualize this service. So there are caveats with it. Um, and I guess the other thing is to mention that this is kind of a self-selected group. These are people that want to come for that extra appointment. There are people who say, actually, no thanks. I, I don't want extra appointments. I've had enough appointments, and I feel fine. So I, I don't think I really need it at this point in time, and that's fine. It's one service that's available. It doesn't fit everybody. Um, and it's not necessary. It's not it may not be necessary for everybody. It may be that some people, if they do have problems in the future, know that it's there and do come back. So patient outcomes, what do we do with patients afterwards? Some people need some monitoring, say if one of the blood results wasn't quite right, we'll just repeat it a, a little time later. Um, supported self-care, if people sort of need other interventions to help, if um, coping strategies sometimes they may, may need to come back to clinic just to check on progress and, and make sure we are heading in the right direction because there's, there's no point actually putting things in if we're not going to check that they're working. Um, so again, there's rehabilitation referrals, GP referrals, specialist referrals. And actually, when you look at it, not many people really needed any serious referrals. Maybe a bit of monitoring because we are belt and braces doing absolutely everything. Most people are absolutely fine. Um, ACP discussions in there, advanced, um, advanced care planning. So that's, um, that's looking at patients who've got metastatic disease. The people who are amazingly living for years after immunotherapy um, with metastatic disease. Um, and it's fabulous to see those patients. But there are, there are anxieties around that. Um, that sort of, it's, it's sort of a, a liminality where the, the feeling of not knowing whether it's how, how long you're going to live, that, that really difficult sort of uncertainty. Um, and sometimes, actually, having those advanced care planning conversations can just help allay some of those fears. So where it's appropriate, I will have those conversations with people. And then occupational assessments for people that are still working, um, whether they've had adjuvant treatment or, or treatment in the advanced setting, people are still working. But sometimes they need adjustments to either their working hours, their setting, they may need a slight change. And quite often, a letter from me will just help their occupational health department or, or something else, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so then, this is the, the reassuring slide, I hope. Um, very few people, we didn't pick up anything that was, that was very new in many people. There were a few things that we picked up that happened after treatment had ended and hadn't been picked up earlier. But, and some people had ongoing side effects. That didn't mean that they were all severe ongoing side effects. I've recorded absolutely everything, no matter how severe it is. Um, and I kind of just used my own little classification to decide if it, someone needed complex intervention or not. And most people are fine. Most people, I will see them once a year, say, how are you? Just have a catch up, do the bloods, see how things are going. Um, and, I, and I don't need to do much more than that. Um, there are a few people who do need more intervention. They do need referrals and they do need um, progress reviews. But they, they are the minority. 
So I hope this is reassuring that most people do absolutely fine. And what do patients think about the service? Uh, well, what do they how did they get on with the effects? Most people said that things improved. So this was an evaluation two and a half, about two and a half years into the service. So some people had been in the service for a little while and they felt that things were getting better after they'd finished treatment over time. So again, this is encouraging knowing that things do improve. Um, whether that was down to the service or not is a different matter. But people generally, um, from this next slide, did feel that it was having some benefit um, whether that was just knowing that there was someone they could talk to, whether that was knowing that if they had a lot of appointments, that someone had an overview of all that and was checking, just checked that it all fitted together. Um, and quite rightly, some people said they, it didn't make much difference and they didn't know because they were absolutely fine anyway. Um, so that is, that's pretty much it. It's a, a bit of a whirlwind tour. What next? We're looking at improving the cardiac screening. Um, we need research. We need bigger numbers. This is a really small amount of people. Um, just to see if this does translate into improved quality of life. Ideally, we need biomarkers to see if we can improve things. Um, another thing would be prehabilitation. Can we actually prevent late effects through prehab? Exploration of late effects in combination with other treatments. Um, and then we've, we're very lucky in Sheffield. We've just got um, a large grant with Yorkshire Cancer Research to look at the remote monitoring of patients on immunotherapy. And there's a late effects arm to that, so hopefully we can increase numbers by using remote monitoring and, and digital services. Um, and I know I'm about at time. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you to all my colleagues. <laughs>